Welcome back to Tales from the Power Rage. How are you doing, guys? Hey, good. Doing well, mate. Good to see you. Good to see you. Right. Uh, tonight we're talking about uh, 1984 and we're going back to Dio and the last in line. And uh, my initial memory from this is not just Dio, but Maiden. We saw Dio and Maiden on two separate tours in the same week. It was amazing. And there was a bit of Egyptology in both of them. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, if you've not seen us before, uh, we are a rock and metal podcast. We talk things all rock and metal. We revisit the years of the Power Age. And uh, tonight we're talking about 1984, the last in line. So uh, let's go on to uh, this tour. So um, we were all there at the mighty Oxford Apollo. So Gav, if you can uh, go on to the next slide, please. And... Um, there were a couple of singles that came out as part of the album, The Last in Line. So do you want, do you want to just talk us through those, Gav? Yeah. Uh, so I think We Rock came out preceding The Last in Line album, as they normally wow. do. So it gave us a little teaser of the album cover. There it is, in all its glory. Um, what's on the B side of that, Dill? Holy Dive Alive and uh, Rainbow in the Dark Live. Nice. You know, I'm, just looking at, I'm going to play that later. Nice little package, that. Yeah, it's nice. And then once the album had come out, we had uh, Mystery as the other single. So I think just the two singles. And then the album came out. Last in line. Brilliant. I originally had this on uh, cassette. Uh, I know we talked about that a few times and on the old Walkman. Um, I loved it. Absolutely brilliant. So there's the there's the album. And... Uh, Dio yeah, was great at doing these inner covers. They looked absolutely fantastic. Yeah, covers with the metal <laughs> heathens. It was yeah. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. fantastic, that cover. So, um, and uh, the inner we, cover, sorry. We, we were excited to see them. So any thoughts on, on the album, guys? Gaps, what were your thoughts on the album? Yeah, I was really, really chuffed to uh, to, to come onto this album after the, the awesome Holy Diver. Unfortunately, all of us were a little bit too young to go to the Holy Diver tour. So when uh, when this album came out and we knew they were going to tour the UK, um, we were so so stoked. I remember going to uh, to the Oxford Apollo and walking up to the uh, box office as you had to do in those days, and uh, buying buying my ticket for uh, what was it five pounds? Probably so bought my perfect. ticket for this at the same time as I bought my Iron Maiden ticket actually, which I think may have been a bit cheaper at four pound fifty, which is unbelievable. So there we are. We're all fourteen and we're going to see two of the most amazing metal bands in the world at that time in the same week. The two uh, of the best singers that have ever... Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think we, we, saw, we, saw, um, we saw Dio first on the 16th of uh, September, and then uh, five days later, we were off to see Iron Maiden. So, yeah, uh, yeah We Rock, Last in Line. Last in Line still one of my favourite songs of all time. Uh, and uh, Egypt, The Chains Are On. Uh, what a great song that is. Yeah, love this album. It's brilliant. And to put it in context, Oxford Apollo has a capacity of 1,800. Now, that was sold out. You could probably get more people in your local Tesco's than were in Oxford <laughs> Apollo that night. That just gives you an indication of uh, what these bands were playing or where these bands were playing at the time. It was quite a big tour, Gav, right? Yeah, I think the back in the day, Dio did the – well, he always did, actually. did the, the legwork, didn't he? He didn't just do a big show in two cities. I mean, we can see that later on on the tour dates, but um, yeah, we were we were so pleased he came to our town. It was amazing. Absolutely. And I think back to the album, um, it was very much following the format of of Holy Diver, but that didn't matter because Holy Diver was great, you know. So I think even how they paced the songs through the album was was very similar. You know, started off with a real rocker, um, and then the title track, and then you know, go through to an epic at the end. But it was great. You know, it had the same similar, it wasn't the same production team, but just Ronnie produced this one. But it sounded very similar and the artwork was very similar. And so we were lapping it up. We were quite happy that they were, you know, repeating themselves to a degree. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really strong album. Still still sounds good today. Jam, any thoughts from the album? Any memories? Yeah, it was, it was, the, for, it was the format. And when you've got a record like Holy Diver that was just out of this world, to then follow it up 
everyone that you know the first record so many bands do a great debut record and then the next one's a little bit a little bit bon jovi ish way but this was just this was a really good record but the thing i remember for this when we were coming along when this record came out is that for dio i was a massive black sabbath dio fan so i really wanted to see dio Snappy, you loved your rainbow so he was into mm. dio yeah and back in the day back this is like our first couple of years of seeing bands we didn't all all of us as a big group of lads we didn't all go to see every band dio was one of the first ones that everyone was into him everyone was into the beat dio band um so i remember pretty much all of us as a quite a group of us eight nine ten lads we were all piling along to this uh, which made it a really big event and as gappy said i remember getting the ticket for this at the same time as getting my maiden i was I was in seventh heaven waiting for these gigs to come out. Mm. It was like the antidote to school because we had to be back at school at the start of September. But it was okay because we had Dio and Maiden in the third week of September. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just remember the buzz. Yeah, the buzz around this time was really, really massive, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, okay. good. So let's go to the uh, – let's have a look at the, the uh, bump on the tour. And the yes. Press. These, back in the day, this is how you got to know what was coming out through sounds and uh, was Kerrang out by then? Can't remember. Yeah, Kerrang was out in eighty one, mate. So yeah, yeah okay. definitely so out. Sounds Kerrang, Melody so that Maker. That was it. It was just it was just sounds and Kerrang for me. Yeah, um, I was still buying sounds at this moment in time. Yeah, so was I. I was getting Kerrang as well. So uh, yeah, and as, as mentioned earlier, look at the tour dates. That's a proper UK tour. That is, uh, and it's brilliant. We had uh, the Oxford date that we said before, but Hammersmith obviously was was normally the end of the tour, and they managed to configure it that it was the end of the tour. And for the for these shows, all and the bands did that though, didn't they? All the bands did Hammersmith as the last two or three yeah. dates. I mean, look, Dio did three dates at Hammersmith in 1984, and they weren't massive, were they? They weren't massive then. To do three dates in 1984 at, uh, at Hammersmith is mental. I love what I love looking at these old adverts because they just stir something in you. Because yeah, absolutely, you're, you're so conditioned bad. to you know we had these on our bedroom walls, didn't we? And yeah. you know probably on our exercise books at school. But <laughs> as you mentioned, this was the crossover time between Kerrang because Kerrang was monthly and Sounds was weekly. Yeah. So you get Sounds was it went off? Uh, I think a Thursday morning. I did a paper round, and one of the reasons I carried on doing my paper round was so that I could read Sounds and not have to obviously try and find the money to buy it. So I'd get to work early, I'd get to the paper shop at like half six so I could read sounds on I think it was a Thursday. So I could, and I'd just, this, when you look at these adverts, this is what it's all about. I still get really turned on by adverts. And I've yeah. been known to, I've bought gig tickets for a band I don't know from their advert before. Did that with <laughs> all pitch gaps, do you remember? I bought tickets to yeah. see all of them. Had no, and I saw the advert, I thought, they look, that looks brilliant. They must be metal. So and back to I, the single, this, this yeah. the mystery was obviously released to promote the tour. Or to yeah. buy <clears throat> so yeah the the we rock was before the album mystery was before the tour so that makes perfect sense excellent so let's have a look at some of the uh, merchandise from the uh, from the gig and the the first piece of merchandise we still have and that's the program yeah and it's kind of weird because yeah. we Which you'll all notice is from the previous album cover it was the previous tour program that we got in the uk which was very odd and I think that there was some previous album tour merch as well. But yeah. I can't recall. I, I remember getting a T-shirt oh, outside. Yeah, the T-shirt the on the right there is, is the, the uh, Holy Diver cover. Yeah, but it was difficult. It's difficult to know which tour they, they came from. But I, I, I put that there because I recall that there was old T-shirts around at the gig as well. But I bought, I bought a dodgy one outside. I know I shouldn't, but I did. Yeah. Or skin. And it fell apart in three weeks. But... Um, it, that was the last in line image on that on that shirt. No, it was just a bit cheap. I don't know why. I don't know why he did that. I mean, it's not a great program anyway. But um, no, it's not. Not, no. When you, not when you compare it to the Power Slave program that we bought five exactly. days later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's nice to have. Um, we have another date at the massive Cornwall Coliseum, which is no longer, unfortunately, for all those people yeah. down in the southwest. That's a hell of a trek down there for any band. So. so in support, we had Queen's Rage. So um, this was an interesting one. I know we've mentioned these once or twice before on previous pods. So um, Jeff and the boys, if you're watching, um, close your ears. Gappy, I'll come to you first. <laughs> well, the, 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 the thing was, I, I don't think I don't think I'm fairly sure that I'm right in saying I I I'd certainly never heard of Queen's Rage before. Um, no. 
or Queen's Reich, however you want to say it. I'd never heard of them. Uh, but we were always into new music and we wanted to see bands. We, it was in the days where you always got in there as, as quick as you can to get down the front. Uh, didn't matter who the support band was. So we, we, we were quite looking forward to seeing a support band, especially another American support band who we'd never heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was it was really quite strange and quite surreal how um, how they came onto the stage, especially uh, Jeff Tate, the the lead vocalist, who uh, came on with some sort of perspex um, surround around his head. Um, <laughs> I, I wish we had a picture of it, but we haven't, unfortunately. And um, for anyone who was at this Oxford gig, please give us a you know give us a comment. Or any gig on this tour. I'm sure any gig on this tour. I mean, I don't know if it it was the only gig he did it at, but I don't know what he was expecting, just stuff to be thrown at him or or something. Or I really have no idea, but it was incredibly strange. And we immediately took a massive dislike to him because, I mean, what (laughs) what are you doing? What are you doing? It was so odd. I honestly thought that it it was less to do with that and more to do with the the strangled cat esque vocals that he was trying out that night in his in his style. Yeah, I mean, um, you could be right. Sound, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, but, yeah. So, bad, but yeah, I, I think maybe, maybe he did of, it for acoustic reasons. Who I knows? I think it was some effects. Yeah, I think it was supposed to be creating some kind of effects or on the line. sound isolation or something. You know, they have perspex around drum kits now, don't they? Yeah, but he made a major. They did make an impression. If you're a support band, you're coming over. You want to make an impression. They made an impression. Unfortunately, on us impressionable young 14, 15 year olds. We just thought they were shy, didn't we? It was a bad and one. It was a bad night. <laughs> anyway, what I it was a bad any, impression. Any impressions a good impression, I think some people That's, would say. That so, is what they say, because we've always remembered it. We don't, we've never forgotten. The, no, we haven't. Sort of, exactly. Yeah. We've never forgotten it. Still yeah. talking about it 40 years later. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we were talking about it on a, on a pod the other night, weren't we? <laughs> so, maybe, maybe he was just ahead of the game. Maybe this was all pre-COVID and he could see it coming in the future. Maybe he was just a, ahead of the time. Who knows? He didn't but, want uh, Oxford gobbing at him. No, that's probably more like it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, suffice to say, um, apart from that, I don't think we really remember much else from, the, from, from not, that. Not a great, not a great, no, you know, but, um, don't. And, a, and a support band playing a guitar solo. What the hell is that all about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but just for balance, as we've said, we have said elsewhere where these yeah. guys have gone have gone to some major critical acclaim. They're, they've got some massive supporters out there, and, and fair play to yeah. them. They've obviously done some really great things since. And I know that a lot of you guys have got quite a few. Have, have got their records, so yeah, yeah, think, yeah, yeah. In the future, went went back, went back into them, and and yeah. Exactly. yeah, it wasn't so bad that we didn't give them a chance later on. No, no that's right. They, we, caught, they, we caught them on a bad night for them. They flunked their think. chance in '84. But, you know, I've got a couple of their albums. I think they're really good. Yes. If, they play, if Silent Lucidity, which is their greatest song for me, had come out uh, for this, then I would have given them a great chance. That's one of my favourite songs by them. Yeah, it's good. OK, good. That's Queen's Right. So let's get to, excuse me, let's get to Dio. Now, 84 was, um, was an interesting year in terms of stage sets. There were a fair few castles and stuff <laughs> hanging around. We'd seen the... Saxon earlier in the year on the Crusader tour, and there was a nice big castle, and another castle <clears> appeared <throat> on the stage for Dio and the Last in Line. Now, my memory is that the drums were up on the back of the castle at the top on the riser, and um, there was also a little bit of Egyptology as well, I think, going on in the evening, certainly for uh, Egypt, the chains are on. I'm sure there was some, and again, if you remember this tour, Please comment, uh, let us know what you remember or what you saw from the night. But I'm sure there was some Egyptology as well. From the gig, a couple of memories. Obviously, the, the the beginning of the gig was amazing. I mean, stand up and shout. Is there a better song to start the set? I'm not sure. Probably there is. not. Absolutely no. fantastic. But I also remember the dark, the lights being quite dark. I know that, that might sound a bit weird in a theatre where it is dark, but sometimes you get bands that have lights that are really light and bright and you can see everything that's going on. This was quite atmospheric. And it was pretty, I remember that. yeah, and and I remember seeing Ronnie. And he, you know, I mean, Ronnie wasn't the tallest guy at the best of times, but even on a stage that was elevated, you could see he was quite a small guy. But he was engaging with the crowd. He was brilliant. His voice was amazing, um, and it was yeah, it was just a it was a great night for a Sunday for a Sunday night as well. <laughs> so uh, that's great, isn't it? So um, yeah, we missed Antiques Roadshow to go and see Dio <laughs> in 1984. So any thought, Gab, what were your memories? Mm. From yeah, I think, I mean, they've got everything going from them, haven't they? They're, every individual member was brilliant. 
you know, as a drummer, he, he's fantastic. Vivian Campbell, you know, being from this side of the pond, all, automatically had our support, and he was brilliant as well. Um, you've got a set list that can pull on two brilliant Dio albums, but also hark back to Sabbath yeah. and Rainbow. I mean, give me a break. We were too young, as we said earlier, to have ever seen Rainbow and Sabbath, but I had an old, older brother who, who you know, uh, certainly Rainbow. I knew all the Rainbow stuff, and I knew his voice from that, and it was like a dream to have this guy in our local town giving it all these classic songs. It, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think it was the last time we saw Viv with the band. So we yeah. didn't know that at the time, obviously, but uh, treasured the fact that I've seen Dio with Vivian. And yeah. The fact I've seen Dio. Right. But it was just great all round. I thought it was a brilliant gig. In interesting point about Vivian. We were talking before the pod. There's not many bands I haven't seen Vivian with, come to think of it. I've seen him in five different bands over the course of his career. So, um, this name them down below. Yeah, name them. See if you can name them. There's your challenge. Yeah, there's your challenge. Right, uh, Jam, <laughs> what do you remember from the night? Um, the thing with Dio, he was he, his voice was so good, just so, so good. And as I said before, we were really looking forward to this, and he, he just took over. I just remember his. Such a, a guy with such a small stature, he just owned the room. And it's a big room, but he owned the room. The atmospheric thing, though, because we were so, we were hanging on there every, every note, weren't we? And all the you know, beginning of Egypt and the, the Holy Diver and then last night, all of that, we just lapped it up. And I fucking love a castle, me. Give me yeah. a fucking castle. some of their evil, blew me away all the time. Give me a castle, give me something, give me some production. And I'm just like, yeah. That's um, what I remember listen. most about that era of, of Oxford yeah. Apollo was the Castles. safety curtain, and you never knew what you were going to get. You, it was going to be a, a family you know, world. It was such it? a small place. They always bought their top stage show. Yeah. You didn't know what you were going to get. It was normally a castle. It's a castle. <laughs> yeah. You were going to get ice, and you were going to get metal. And you were going to get shell. something. You weren't going to get just marshals and a black no, backdrop. No. You were always going to ah. get some fantasy, like, like Jam said. And it was. Unless you went to MSG. But it was right. fine because that was the exception. That was awesome. That was how it should be. But, but otherwise, even, Mag even Magnum and bands like that had had a production of some description. You know, it yeah. was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, it, it was just it was just seeing Ronnie for me for this because uh, a massive Rainbow fan, and uh, I was so so stoked when they played Man on the Silver Mountain and Long Live Rock and Roll. It was just absolutely <laughs> mental for me. Uh, yeah, his voice is amazing. But uh, one of my other abiding memories, because uh, we'd seen a lot of bands and we'd seen a lot of keyboard players and they'd always been on stage, but uh, they had a keyboard player called Claude Schnell who was actually shoved off to the side of the stage and you couldn't actually see him. But you could, you, you could just about see him, but he wasn't actually part of the band or he wasn't supposed to be part of the band and he was playing sort of to the side of the stage. Just and about make out his tash. Yeah, you could just about, yeah. And uh, and obviously he does the intro to Rainbow in the Dark, and he he plays on a lot of the other songs as well. But uh, yeah, it was really strange because uh, he wasn't a, an official member of the band. Was it till the next album? Yeah, no, he, he is. Oh, he is. Yeah, so, he so he's an official cool. member on the album. So why did they shove him off to the side of the stage where no one can see him? Well, it's do you so know what? Interestingly, Mike Tramp, who I saw in Camden last year, was just he does a funny sort of anecdote or story about keyboard players <laughs> generally around not just what they look like, but where they end up on the stage. And he was saying, you knew where the keyboard player was because he had the curly hair, the tash, and he'd always be pushed off to the side of the stage. And no <laughs> he, he'd seen. obviously seen Dio on his tour then. <laughs> well, I think, I think it was maybe something to do with the times, but uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a really good shout. It was great times that they, there's so many big bands and you could hear the freaking, you could hear them, whether it was in Ozzy Osbourne or whoever it was, you could hear them and you just couldn't see them. It's just hilarious. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. So look, overall, I think really good gig. I remember it being really loud as well. I don't know if any of you remember. Um, it certainly, it certainly blew me away. I mean, we were down in the pit as they were in the day in the Oxford Apollo. I think they used to take the five, six, the first five or six rows out and then, um, you know, there was a, a, a bit of a snake pit going on, a bit of a mosh pit before moshing. Um, but it was really loud. He was brilliant. The only other memory that I have for the gig is that it wasn't, it was quite short. I think it was an hour and 15 or so, which was, uh, yeah, which was a bit long, wasn't it? And it shouldn't have been that short, something. should it? But we were a bit disappointed at the length, without a doubt. Yeah, very disappointed. So any, any thoughts around that, Gaps? Can you remember the length of the gig? 
Yeah, I just remember how 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 disappointed we were uh, be, because it was so short. He, but looking at that set list now, it, you think it, how could it have been that short? It's, no, it's it weird. is weird, but, but we, yeah. we 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 all came out of that gig thinking, "Hang on a minute, they they finished. That's it." Yeah. In hindsight, though, I'm glad because with that short set, when we returned on the Friday and we saw Maiden play a two-hour set, I happened to pass out during running free, which is the encore. You did. <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't too long because I'd have been in motion state, would I? Had to drag him up to the Friday. But yeah, yeah, it was quite inconvenient because we had to wait 20 minutes for our mum and dads to pick us up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we didn't get anything signed either. Anyway, a couple of things for the programme, which I think are quite interesting. Um, there's a little bit about uh, the fan club, which, uh, do you know what, in hindsight, I wish I'd bothered, because actually the pound was really strong against the dollar at the time. So thank you very much for your support and enthusiasm. We put together a membership package just for you for an annual fee of $10, which would have been about a five or a week's money on a paper round. Right then, yeah. You'll receive a membership card, a personally autographed photo of Ronnie, not Xerox or Xerox, Xeroid or whatever it was. It rang Xerox. 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 Yeah, Xerox is correct. Xerox, that's right. A club button, profiles on each band member, a lyric <laughs> sheet, Holy Diver, periodic contests, a quarterly newsletter with tour information, what's happening in the DO camp, and much more. Access to merch merchandise available exclusively through the DO fan club, and send your money to. Where the hell's that? Yes. California. <laughs> California. <laughs> anyway, ten dollars for a bargain. If did anyone join the Do fan club, I'd love to know. And please share with us on Twitter on here a yeah. picture of your uh, of your Do picture. If I knew then what I know now, I'd have joined that all day long. I had the attention span of a gnat, so I wouldn't have even read it. To be fair. So, <laughs> anyway, on that note. Uh, Let's go to the, the artwork's brilliant for this as well, Gav. I, I, do you want to just cover off the um, what's the yeah, monster called? Yeah, the the monster's Murray apparently. Murray the monster. Murray, Murray the the devil figure. But yeah, you don't often see it like this, so I thought I'd just pop this in just to luxuriate in the artwork. And um, so basically, it's wrapped around. So what you're seeing on the left is the back half of the record. Yeah. Rodney what Matthews a shame! Style, but... What a shame that that couldn't have been a gatefold, even if it was on the back yeah. of the front and you open it out. Yeah, that's, that's gorgeous. It's going mm. for a re-release, isn't it? Yeah, mm. that's fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. But, okay, yeah, good times. Well, that's, that's Dio, the last in line, live from Oxford Apollo. Hope you all enjoyed that. If you did enjoy it, please like, subscribe, comment, tell us your memories from that tour. Really love uh, love to know that. Tell us if you joined the fan club. We'd love to know that and see the signed Dio picture and see if it was Xerox or not. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see more videos that we've taken from gigs, sadly none of uh, Ronnie James Dio because uh, none of us had a phone then to be able to do that. Uh, check out Tales from the Power Age Live on YouTube. We've got lots of different videos on there, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Um, you can find us on Facebook, so please engage with us there. You can find us on Twitter on Tales from the Power Age and TTFTPR, easy to find, and we love a bit of a chat on there too, online on www.talesfromthepowerage.com. Or if you want some merch, not this merch, but Tales from the Power Age merch, you can get it direct from there. And uh, look out for us at uh, any local gigs that we um, that we frequent, which is generally London, Oxfordshire, Bucks, or anywhere else that we're basically. Finally, if you haven't subscribed, Please subscribe, please comment, hit the house bell. We'll see you again soon. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.